your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens As your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Let us look to Jesus this morning. Father, we thank you for your presence, Jesus. We welcome you, King Jesus, into this place, God. Lord, we pray, have your way today, Lord. Father, we make room for you this morning. Lord, we yield to what you want to do. We open our hearts, Jesus. God, we ask you to magnify your son this morning. Lord, as we look to you today, God, we ask you to move amongst this place. Touch your people, Lord. Lord, have your way. Be magnified, Jesus, we pray. 
We welcome you, Lord. In Jesus' name.
Yeah, just, just continue to play that. Just continue to look to the Lord. I want us just to sing a heavenly language to the Lord. Just sing a new song to the Lord this morning. I feel like there's just this bubbling up right now in the congregation that we just need to let out a new song to the Lord. Do you want to just play a melody unto the Lord? a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. We honor your name, we honor your name. Mama, yeah, Jesus, we say, have your way in this place today, God. We honor your name, Father. We thank you, Lord. We say, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest place, Father. Hosanna in the highest places, God. We welcome you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We honor your name. Have your way, have your way. Have your way, have your way. We honor your name.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we honor your name in this place today, God. We honor you, King Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, Father. Take your rightful place in this house, Jesus. We thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you for you, Jesus. We ask you for an increase of that, Lord. We say, come, Lord Jesus. We ask for your fire to fall upon this place, Jesus. A fresh fire even today, Lord. Lord, we welcome you in this place. We welcome you, King Jesus. We welcome you, King Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Give it up to our amazing worship team. Man, it's so good. I was so lost, I forgot my Bible even coming up here. I had to go down and get it. Oh, man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, happy Palm Sunday to everyone. We are entering into Holy Week this week, or the Great Week, as they say, and uh, it's just such a great week that uh, we can really focus on what the Lord has done for us, and the cross, and salvation, and all those good things, and um, I get the joy and privilege and honor to do the announcements this morning, and uh, we have Good Friday coming up, which is also Fellowship Friday simultaneously, so that's pretty cool. So Fellowship Friday is... Coming up uh, this Friday, the doors open at 6 p.m. Uh, this is the last Fellowship Friday of the winter trimester, and this is for Academy students only. Um, but if you do want to come and take a look at what it's like and you have a friend that is a student, um, you can have them email into info at ascendacademy.com on your behalf, and you can come and audit the Fellowship Friday and play some pickleball with us or some ping pong or whatever you all want to do, eat some good food. So that, uh, that's coming up March 29th. Um, the next announcement, we have the Ascend Gathering coming up in April. Yes, Lord. That'll be April 12th through the 14th. And we have the Michaels. And so we have the Greek, the Spanish. And I was thinking about Brian, like we have the Cajun. So <laughs> you mix those together, it's like a deadly combination. So, But that'll be good. You want to register for that at ascendgatherings.com or you can scan the uh, QR card behind us and you can register for that. It's gonna be a really good time. The last time it was, it was amazing. It was also very jam-packed in here, so you definitely wanna register before that fills up. But always a good time of just going after the Lord and uh, just seeing what the Lord will do. Um, the next time is we have an online service only on April 21st, so it's only online. It will not be in person, so please uh, don't come to that. Uh, no one will be here for that. Um, and so next I'll be just transitioning into tithe and offering, um, if you all want to bring the baskets up. Um, I just really felt like this week the Lord was highlighting uh, specifically uh, Him as King. And uh, I think oftentimes we forget just because we live on this earth and we don't, sing, we don't see a lot of kings, um, but Jesus is King. 
And I have a dear friend uh, that says that a lot, Jesus is King. And he's actually in the house today, and I want to honor him. Uh, Isaac and Hannah, they're in the house, if you want to stand for me. Isaac's right, a very dear friend of mine. Uh, served along uh, Brother David Hogan in Mexico for many, many, many years. So they're in the States now, and uh, honor him dearly. But that is one of the things that he says often is, Jesus is King, and in that, I just uh, was reading Esther um, and want to kind of just speak something that the Lord is putting on my heart. Uh, if you want to turn to Esther chapter 5 uh, with me. And, uh, you know, Jesus is king, and his lordship and his kingship, oftentimes we don't realize the authority that he has as king. And as I was reading this fresh, it's actually um, yesterday and today is also uh, Purim which is very interesting because I didn't know that when I was reading this and my dear wife Aurelia told me that it was Purim this week, which is the celebration of that freedom that the Jewish people received from her obedience. And I thought that was very uh, timely from the Lord. But uh, I'm just going to read out of Esther chapter 5 and start in verse 1. It says, Now it came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's rooms. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room, opposite the entrance of the palace. When the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter which he had in his hand. So Esther came near and touched the top of the scepter. Then the king said to her, What is troubling you, Queen Esther? And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be given to you. And Esther said, if it pleases the king, may the king and, his, and Haman come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. And there was so much the Lord highlighted to me. But one, you know, he's looking for a bride on the earth right now. And I couldn't help the depiction the, the bridegroom king and the bride here in this depiction. And Esther, by faith, is bringing the ultimate offering to the Lord. She realizes in this moment that she could die. So she's offering the greatest sacrifice in her life that she can give at that time. Her people are going through a very hard time. She's going through hard times. And what does she do? She, in obedience by faith, comes to the king to find favor with the king. And there's no greater faith than when you're laying down your life for another. And she realizes this, and the king sees this and extends not only favor, but actually says he's going to give her half the kingdom. And I just saw in a fresh, crystal clear way that even in our, our life, we know even Quentin was preaching on this last time, that he's, he's coming to the earth and he's looking for those who have faith. And he's also looking for those as the bride who have prepared themselves. And Esther did that exact thing. She prepared herself to go into that courtroom, to enter in by faith so that the king would possibly see favor. And I see this as just a great depiction of tithe and offering uh, in our lives. We, we don't know the measure that's been given when we're extending what God's asking of us in faith. And to see the Lord say and meet her in that way to say, I'm going to give you half of that of the kingdom. And I also just want to have you turn real quick to just a couple of pages to 8, 15, 17. It says here, Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes and blue and white with a large crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. For the Jews, there was light and gladness and joy and honor. In each and every province and in each and every city, whatever the king's commandment and his decree arrived, there was gladness and joy for the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many among the people in the land became Jews, for the dread of the Jews had fallen upon them. This also was just highlighted to me for one, the Purim aspect of this festival that it's speaking of. But also, you don't realize when you are giving to the Lord in obedience, whether it's the online uh, attendance that we have that can change people's lives or what you're sowing into this house and growing and magnifying that the Lord is asking in this house. You don't realize the benefits that in the future others can attain from the Lord. Salvation, joy, and honor that can literally change people's lives, that can change a city. You, you don't really know the magnitude of your simple obedience and faith 
of giving what God has asked you to give. So I just wanted to share and encourage you guys with that. Uh, I'm going to pray and we'll, we'll play a short video. Father, I thank you for speaking to us, Lord, that we would be a bride made ready, Father. Lord, that by faith we would be obedient to whatever you're speaking to us to give today, Father, for the house and for the future of whatever that holds for other people, Lord, where it may be salvations or somebody encountering the presence of the Lord or their families radically changed because of our obedience, God. We thank you for preparing us, Lord, for you and your return, Lord. We thank you for that by faith, Lord, whatever it is that Holy Spirit, you're speaking to us to give into your kingdom, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. in the glory of God. Oh my gosh, he kept hitting these ebbs and flows of reverence, awe, purity, intimacy. There's a river, man, almost like a rainbow river, different colors, you know. But I'm super expectant uh, for this morning as it continues. Dear friend, I want to take a second, if you could hold the applause to honor him. David Papavisi, many of us know, is, is in the house with us and it's going to be epic as it always is. He marks us every time. The Lord through him, of course. Our lives are changing. His beautiful wife, Danielle, you mind waving at him? She's here as well. Yeah. <clears throat> she, uh, she wrote Proverbs 32. <laughs> but um, before I forget, at the end of service, after David releases the word and goes whatever direction he wants to, we're just going to follow the Holy Spirit as always. Um, we're going to close out as well the end of the service with communion. So you definitely want to stay for that. William will be leading us in that. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you mind coming quick, William? I want to share with them to build their faith as well and give God glory that recent um, testimony. They just, it pretty much, we're waiting for a doctor's report, but it pretty much sounds like this lady, four-stage cancer was healed, coming to buy a couch on Facebook Messenger from William. So you mind sharing the story quick? Yeah, so Mabel and I, we got a chance to minister to this lady. Uh, she came to buy a couch from our home. So when she came in, I asked about, uh, you know, oh, back up. So before she came, she told us that she's got cancer, that if you can help her to load the couch. So, so Mabel and I, we were already, you know, we were already praying. There was something that stirred within us when we heard this. So when she came in, sure enough, she lost her hair with all the chemo and everything. So we, I asked her, hey, so you have cancer? She was like immediately, are you a doctor? I was like, no, I'm not a doctor, but I know the doctor who is... <laughs> who is the doctor of doctors. And then and immediately we could sense that she was, she was a believer. She could, we could sense that the faith was building and we started sharing about Jesus and our own personal testimony, what Mabel and I and kids are walking and she was receiving it and the, the faith was building up, building up. We laid our hands on her, we prayed with her and her friend, another friend came with her and, uh, and then we, we sensed that the God was doing something powerful in her life. Sure enough, this was two weeks ago. Last This week, uh, we got a text from her saying that, you know, that she went to the doctor for a checkup and that, uh, you know, her number was usually... Uh, for a stand, for a regular normal number, it is like five to six. Her number was 21. She had a stage four colon cancer, and now it's back to six. You know, <laughs> and uh, 
So praise God. All glory to God. I'm, I'm, we are awaiting the final, unless if she is here. She said she's going to come visit us. Uh, yes, yeah, son lives in Conyers and, you know, she is uh, thinking about coming, visiting us like Pastor Brian. I'm all excited, by the way, for to hear from David Papa Visi. But uh, after that, towards the end for communion, I, I believe that God is about to do some some healing in our midst as well. So let's let's press on to him. To God be the glory. Glory. Praise God. Give God praise. Isn't that awesome? Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Brian from McDonough. What's up, my man? I see you. So good to see you again. Uh, but isn't that awesome? How I many of you know Jesus still heals today? You know, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So just want to raise your expectancy and faith. All of our family across the world online tuning in as well. Right there in your home. Go ahead and grab some crackers and juice, something. And uh, as we partake of the Lord's broken body and shed blood, especially in this holy week, and first and foremost to become one with him, intimately in union, but then also from that in the new covenant, you can be healed immediately in your body, so it's going to be good. But yeah, David, as many of you know, my, my dearest friend in all of the world, we go way back, and I want to say 99, like yeah, I was born again, 98, got thrust over to Bible college in Pensacola, and we linked up right away. I remember I was just telling my kids, somehow we were talking about the Papavisis. They're so dear to us. Um, Zoe, she was in with us as long as she could be. We had to duck back out sumo, man. Just intercede for him. He's doing good, though. But she, we just, that, that potty training is super key in the, in the Garan crib. Uh, so she ducked out. She's going to be watching online. But she's close friends with Yaya, Yaeli, their daughter. She's like Mother Teresa 2.0. And, um, and then is incredible young man, Elias, I day their children, uh, super close with them. And I was just telling them, I said, man, I remember the day, you may not remember this, David, but you had just met Danielle, or y'all were talking about actually, not met, but getting married. We were still in Bible college together. Like we go way back before even marriage and kids and all that. And uh, we were in New Dimensions, the last part of uh, before graduating, but been the dearest, most closest friend, more like Jesus than anybody I know. Not that you start to compare and all, but he's just so full and like Jesus. That's the best way I can say it. Such a depth of the word, such wisdom. He's really an apostle. If you look at it through scriptural terms, he wouldn't like me calling him this, but um, the incredible work in Iraq. They've now been there over a decade, 11 years on the ground. And um, yeah, go ahead and honor the Lord. And, and then... And I don't know if you guys know, but it's not, it's a little different when you go into a country like that. I mean, ground up, learning the language. I'll, I'll be on calls with him and he'll jump in taxis and he, he's speaking Arabic and they've literally learned the language and become one with the people. And I don't know what direction he's going to go this morning, but seeing so much fruit, people born again, miracles, healings. Um, one I can think of a nearby city he went to, and they're going into dreams. Like John the Baptist came to this one young lady, and they're having to interpret it for these people that know nothing about the Lord. And um, the Lord's moving so powerfully in so many different ways through their ministry. We could spend all day talking about it, but he was just in Egypt preaching. He's all over. But we're so thankful they took the time to pop in and be with us and deposit all that they continued to and mark us as a house. If you could please stand in honor, the one and only David Papavisi. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You guys can be seated. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for today, for Palm Sunday, even as uh, we're approaching Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we thank you. That it's a reminder, and in fact, every time we partake of communion, it's a reminder of who you are. It's a reminder of what you have done, who you are in our midst, what you are making us into. And Lord, it is a reminder and a proclamation of the return of the Lord. We worship you, Lord. We, we acknowledge your presence in the house this morning. Lord, we want to encounter you. We want to hear your voice this morning. Lord, we want to be transformed by your voice. Lord, reveal to us the beauty, the glory, the truth of Jesus, your son, in your word, through the cross, and change our lives, God. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful to be with you all today. Uh, Pastor Brian, I honor him deeply, love him. Thank you, uh, Pastor Brian. His friendship means more than I can say. It's wonderful to be able to travel with Danielle. Uh, today, yesterday, we celebrated 22 years. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, blessed. And so today, um, I don't want to take too much time because I, I, I want us to be able to join together in communion. But um, let me see where we'll start. I may not necessarily turn to every passage for the sake of time, but really felt impressed by the Lord today to look at the cross afresh. But from the angle of the wisdom of the cross, we need wisdom in this, honor, in this hour. Amen? We need the wisdom of God in this hour. And when you're in the midst of storm, you can't just go run and get prepared. You better be ready. So we want to we walk as people of wisdom. And it's important to, to differentiate between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. Because these two kinds of wisdoms are two different types of logic, two different paradigms and worldviews that are very much at odds. Sometimes it's easy to buy into the wisdom of the world and slap Christian words on it and be convinced that it's biblical and so when I when we're talking about the wisdom of God what, what I'm not talking about we're not talking about just five steps to a better fill in the blank now there are some truths to things like that I'm not saying that you should never read some kind of a you know you know books on wisdom and leadership principles and things like that. there are some good things and practical principles that if you apply to your life they work but the wisdom of God looks very different from the wisdom of the world the wisdom of the world is all about you know 10 steps to and it's always unto some form of measurable worldly growth when I say worldly I don't necessarily mean evil but the metric system of success is always rooted here. Try to find a wisdom book, you know, in your local airport. You know, when you guys, well, I don't know what those like, stores are, you know, but you always find those kind of Christian books in, this, in a little corner. There's a, they're always somehow like leadership or principles to something book. Try to find one that says... Work hard, build up until a certain point, and then just give it all away. <laughs> You're not going to find one, right? I mean, let's just think a little bit about the life of Jesus. Jesus is at the apex of popularity in ancient Israel after three and a half, which is a very short time, of public ministry. We have, we have a society in ancient Israel that was living in, in, in daily or annual generation by generation anticipation for the, for the coming of the Messiah who would make all things right. And then Jesus appears and they say, we've never seen a prophet like this in Israel. He does things in ways that have never been seen before. He raises the dead. He controls nature. The crowds are gathering. He doesn't speak as the other rabbis or scribes. He teaches as one with authority. Peter is ready. Peter and, and John and James encounter him on the mountain and see a, revel, a majestic revelation of glory. God the Father pulls back the veil and the curtain and allows them to see Jesus in his glorified form. And he thinks the way th somebody who would be writing a five steps to success book would think let's build tents up here and make this the glory the glory disneyland the kingdom disneyland for all people from the nations to come and visit and then jesus starts taking him aside and saying things like the son of man must be crucified now that doesn't look like wisdom but the bible says that the cross is the wisdom of god it doesn't look like the wisdom of the world, but it is, it is the essence of the wisdom of God. 
And so we need the wisdom of God in this hour. We need the wisdom of the cross in this hour. And wisdom is unto, is unto fulfilling our mandate in Christ. All, this life echoes forever into the ages to come. It's, it's very important that we take our, we live our lives with sobriety. It's very important that we live our lives filled with the Holy Spirit. It says in the word of God in Ephesians, Paul says, Do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come underneath the influence of the Holy Spirit. The intoxication of the Holy Spirit. The most sober people in this life are the most filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit causes us to live in a divine sobriety so that we would live lives in such a way that will make perfect sense 5,000 years from now. We need the wisdom of the cross. It says in Proverbs 3.19 that the, by wisdom the Lord laid the foundations of the earth and by understanding he built the heavens. The Lord created all that is seen and unseen. There are unseen realities that are more real right now and have been more real from our, however long it's been that are more real than things that we see. And God created all seen and unseen by wisdom. We, one of the things that we need, to, we need to learn in this hour and in our lives is what it means to be truly redeemed humans. It's important to know that God does not save us from being human. Being human is not, some, some, is, is not a negative thing. He redeems our humanity from the powers of sin and death and brings us into union with himself. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is addressing a church in Corinth that has all kinds of issues with the flesh, with carnality, with sin, with divisions. And he says to them, this is the, the brunt of his rebuke. He says to them, why are you behaving like mere humans? God has called us to live as redeemed humans. Adam and Eve, in fact, were called, were created and called to a mandate. They were made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God, I believe, implies many different things. They were made to be loved. They were made for love. They, they, they were made as intelligent beings. They were made with a free will. They're created with a free will. There are many things that we can deduce when we look at the original creation of humans and what it means to be made in the image of God. But one thing is specifically noted and highlighted. They were made in his image as a, as a family. And they were made in his image to rule like he does. That's important. They were made in his image as family. God creates Adam and he pulls Eve from his side, so to speak. God himself is a divine family of one. Father, son, and spirit always have been, always will be. They were made in his image in that sense. And they were made in his image in that they were called to act like him submitted to his authority he invites his created ones his family the extension of his creation to join him and be like him because love invites those he creates into what he himself is doing and we see in the garden of eden uh in fact you could turn very quickly to genesis chapter 3 Beginnings are important. It's important for us to study beginnings. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the encounter that Adam and Eve have with the serpent at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in chapter 3, it begins with now the serpent was more crafty 
than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent was more crafty than any other creature that God had made. That word crafty is a word that could be used as a synonym for wise. In fact, Jesus himself says to his disciples that he sends out two by two to be wise as what? Serpents. I don't know if you know this or not, which we won't delve into this because this could be a rabbit trail that we can get off for a long time. But in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, see, he has an encounter with an exalt, the exalted Lord in the temple. And again, the veil is pulled back and he's allowed to see what is happening in the dimension that, that, that God calls his home. And he sees these angelic beings around his throne that the Bible calls seraphim. You guys remember the seraphim? Yes. And, they're, and they're covering their face, covering their feet, flying and yelling out into creation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Now, it's interesting because when we read the Bible, in whatever language you may be reading it, you're reading a translation of an original manuscript. So if whatever the word may be, you know, the word crafty has a, has a correlating word in the original language that implies something like a, a type or a form of wisdom. But the word seraphim is not translated. That is the original word. We read seraphim thinking that's a translation of some Hebrew word. No, that, that is the original word. Do you know what the translation of the, of the word means? fiery serpent now that might put a little bit of a twist on the way that you picture these angelic beings but that's for another day we're not going to get into that <laughs> but we do know one thing he was once a majestic being who was to channel the wisdom of God within creation in measure but he was instead corrupted by a self-absorbed desire for his own personal greatness his own personal gratification and his wisdom is now corrupted and his wisdom now corrupts there are listen there is very much a different kind of wisdom at work in the world we need the wisdom of the cross his decisions as a result now became foolish and they only lead to destruction james chapter 3 if you want to turn there quickly talks about wisdom from the perspective of meekness. In verse 13 of James 3, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Wisdom walks hand in hand with meekness. It says that when Eve saw the fruit, and it's important to think as well, like the significance of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent says to Eve, no, 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 no. It's not as God says, for the Lord knows that in the day, of, in the day that you partake of it, your eyes will be opened and you shall be like God. Just remember those words. Your eyes shall be opened so that you can be like God or you yourself can be God or gods. And it says that Eve sees that the tree was pleasant to the taste, attractive to the eye, and had the ability to what? make one wise that was the counterpart of what it meant to act like God this is what John says in first John chapter 2 do not love the world or anything that is in the world for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh he breaks it down to three segments the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes that's what Eve saw and the pride of life James says the meekness of wisdom. The wisdom of this world is very much man-centered. 
It glorifies and exalts man. The wisdom of God makes much of Jesus. Amen. Jesus, three and a half years, is at the peak of his ministry. You can read all kinds of books of, on how to build whatever, how to build your ministry, how to build influence. I don't think one of them is going to look like Jesus' charter. That one may not sell well. When's the last time you got a prophetic word that says something to the effect of not you're going to fill stadiums, but God is calling you to be completely forgotten and serve him on the backside of nowhere and exalt the cross? You get one of those recently? <laughs> wisdom is more than just applying principles. Wisdom is the personification of Jesus. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for he has become to us wisdom. And he talks about the word of the cross is wisdom and Eve saw the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and bought the lie from the serpent that if she would partake in disobedience that her eyes would be opened so that she can receive wisdom she recognized that wisdom was necessary in order to fulfill the mandate but she sought to do it outside of submission to Christ and his living word The wisdom of this world is completely focused on the magnifying of man. And the longer that we're alive and the more that we move into the next year and the next year and the next year and, and the development of media and technology and social media and everything, the things that we have right now that we didn't have when we were, some of us didn't have when we were growing up, right? I was, I was having a conversation with some of the guys in Iraq. We're doing like a, a three-month discipleship program for some Muslim background believers who got born again. And part of the program is you can't have your phone with you. We got them all living in the same place. At nighttime, you turn in your phones. You wake up, you spend time with Jesus in the morning, you don't got your phones. Amen. You can have it during breakfast, you start class, not with your phone. And we, we live in a day and age where the average person is on their phone like 12. I don't know what it is. 12. You're, we're so wired to it that we can't even live without it. And initially when we shared it, they're like, oh my goodness, that's like, that, you guys are kind of legalistic. This is insane. I was like, do you realize I got my, my first phone after I got married? They're like, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, I got my first cell phone after I got They're like, how, how did you live? I was like, they didn't have any. <laughs> well, they probably did have some, but at that point they were so expensive. <laughs> how many of you remember car phones? I was like, listen, I grew up without the internet. They're like, how did you live? I was like, we used to go out and, and go, you'd go out from home, you'd go out and play with your friends. Your parents had no idea where you were. If they wanted to find you, they'd drive around and look for your bicycle to see which house you, you st That's the way you found your kids. Look for the bike. And if you let your friend borrow your bike, then you were in trouble because your parents were like, how are you going to let your friend borrow your bike and I try to find you? <laughs> That's the way that we grew up. But the more that we're moving in the direction of, the more that we see the wisdom of this world teaching humanity the principle of self-exaltation. Yes. God forbid you don't post a picture and get 100 likes. God forbid. We need the wisdom of God. The, the wisdom of God is self-effacing. It's humility. It's laying down our lives. It's not seeking to be sought out. It's seeking to be, it's seeking to be in the presence of Jesus. It's seeking his glory being made known. That's what we need, the wisdom of God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the redefinition of, of what God says is real and true and what he says is false and lie. Do you know what a false prophet is? A false prophet is not necessarily somebody who gives a word that doesn't come to pass. That's a false prophecy. A false prophet is somebody who may very well may have 
anointing of some form or another, but their heart is twisted. That's a false prophet. The devil's a false prophet. He had very real anointing that was given to him by God, but his wisdom was corrupted because his heart was corrupt. We, we, we live in that day and honor and hour right now where there's a redefinition of everything that's real. People all over the world, I feel like I'm a woman today. You're born a man, I feel like, well, that's not real. If you're born a man, you're a man. It's not real. I feel like whatever the case may be, it doesn't, listen, God determines what is real. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we can look at it and think to ourselves, what's so, what's so offensive to God about a tree that reveals the knowledge of good and evil? It's because when man partakes in rebellion, man now sets himself up as God. It's the magnifying of humanity rather than the magnifying of God himself. It's when we take unto ourselves or, or we feel like we take on to ourselves the, the right to determine what we can and can't do. Just because they made weed legal, I don't know if it's weed legal here. I know it's legal where we just came from in Chicago. Doesn't mean that you get to smoke it. It doesn't, there's Christians in churches right now getting high. It's, listen, that's not real. That's called disobedience to God and debauchery. That's what that's called. That's called opening up your mind to devils. And then you come to get prayed for and wonder why. Give me five steps. Here's a step. Repent. There goes the first step. It says the wisdom, it says in, in James 3, by his good conduct, let him show his works in meekness of wisdom. It says, but if you have bitterness or if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above. Now look, there is a different wisdom. There's one that comes from above. But this is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. It says, but the wisdom from above is first what? Pure. The wisdom from above upholds purity, upholds the value of scripture, and then peaceable and gentle and open to reason and full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Now, we know that at, at, at the encounter in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve failed. But actually, what they were supposed to do is judge the serpent according to the word of the Lord. Now, when we think of the word judge, it's used in different words in the Bible. I, I'm sorry, it's used in different ways in the Bible. There is the... Thou shalt not judge, but according to the measure that you judge others, you yourself shall be judged. So that's the, you know, that's the random person in church who you meet and immediately red flags go up because they're like, I have the gift of the sermon. And you're like, oh, okay. And you, I'm not going to assume what you mean, so why don't you go ahead and tell me. <laughs> when I meet people, I immediately know everything about them. I was like, okay. <laughs> All right. And then whoever I, whoever I really want to mess with in the room, I'm like, you should go talk to this guy right here. <laughs> you should go talk to John there in the back. I think he'd be really interested to hear more about this. He's like, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. John comes up later on. He's like, bro. I'll buy you a coffee, John. i owe you for that one. Right? So there's, there's that kind of judgment. Assuming people's motives. Assuming. Then there's the judgment of God. We shall all stand before the Lord and be judged for our works. Paul says it clear as day. We will stand before the throne of Jesus and we will be judged for our works. Now there is a judgment for believers and there is a different judgment for unbelievers. One is unto condemnation. 
One is unto either suffering loss of rewards or receiving inheritance and rewards. But it says, Paul says to the Corinthians, that we shall be judged according to the works or the deeds done in the body. Not according to the yes in your heart. Let me clarify. If you have a yes in your heart that doesn't translate into actual decisions, with the heart, a man believes. With the heart. And then with the mouth, one confesses unto salvation. The Lord talks about how out of the heart comes forth either righteous or unrighteous thoughts. The Lord is after the heart. Paul, in fact, prays for the eyes of the heart to be open so that we would know God. But we need more than just a yes. Just God just wants your yes. Not just the yes on the inside, but the yes that follows it up with actual decisions. That's wisdom. That's the wisdom of God. Then there's the other word judge, the third way that it's used, which is making a decision based upon the truth of Scripture. Adam and Eve were called to, to take dominion or to co-rule or to be representatives of God and his kingdom on the earth. And that is not some kind of like a, some of us may hear that and we may be, want to shy away from it. Like, no, 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 I, I don't want that. I don't want that. No, no, no. Listen, that, that is what God has designed us to do. What do you think that we will do forever with him? This is what Jesus says to the churches in the book of Revelation. We don't need false humility in this area. And if you struggle with pride, don't worry. The way to get there is through lowliness in the cross. God will kill it in you on the way. This is what he says to the churches in Revelation. He says to those that overcome compromise, sin, false, false doctrine, all the, the fear of death. To those that overcome, you shall sit with me on my throne and rule with me. We were created to, according to the word of God, make decisions, not just for our own personal family, but on, for, for the sake of his kingdom, in partnership with him, right? Anybody here who's a parent makes judgments, right? We make judgments. So we need wisdom to make righteous judgments. We need wisdom to make the kinds of decisions that point to Jesus and that are in keeping with the truth of Scripture. Amen. They were supposed to judge the serpent at the tree. That's what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to release a judgment. The Lord Jesus rebuke you. The Lord God has said you shall not eat. The Lord Jesus rebuke you. That's what Jesus did in the wilderness when he was tempted. He used the word of God and pronounced a judgment. Not from his just random thoughts that came into his mind but in accordance to the word of God and that's what we're talking we need wisdom unto living our lives in such a way that makes sense of the cross as redeemed humans they instead are conquered by the serpent they themselves now take on his animalistic nature the promise that their eyes would be open is now an exposure to a world where foolishness makes sense. Blind to God, but awakened to every other thing that stimulates the five senses. Paul, Paul gets born again, and when he sees the glory of God, the eyes that were, listen, we're all born with eyes blind to God. And open to a, to, to a world that is immersed in an antichrist system. You get born again, you know what happens? In measure, you see the glory of God. In measure. However you got born again. An encounter that you had with God at, at an altar. At, at, your, your, your mother, your grandmother led you to the Lord. However it was, you could have been a child, you could have been older. You see by faith a measure of the glory of God. And when you do... There's a, there's a closure that takes place. There's a blinding that takes place. Paul, when he sees the glory of God in Christ, is blinded and his eyes don't open again until he's filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Because that's what sight is in God's kingdom. His eyes open up again when he's filled with the Holy Ghost. And an ice lays hands on him and his eyes open as he's filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the wisdom of God. We can now make sense out of life. Now the things that the world say we should pursue, we look at and we're like, man, I was just talking to Pastor Brian about this uh, over breakfast today. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and they were just talking about things that and I'm not going to get into the details, but in the, in, in the eyes of the world, it makes so much sense. And to me, I was like, man, it just seems so, it, it, it honestly seems like lame to me. Like, I'm not interested at all. Nothing about that is appealing to me at all. I, talk to me about the fear of God. Talk to me about loving Jesus. Talk to me about giving up our lives and our rights for the sake of God's glory and the good of others. That's, a, that's appealing. That's what, that's what God is wanting to do in our hearts. God shows us how he rules the world through the cross. Loving obedience for God, loving service for the good of others. It's baptized in a spirit of humility. This is the paradigm that we ought to contend for. You know, when, when Solomon himself had an encounter with God in the night, God said, you can ask me, for, you know, you can have one, have one wish. What would that look like if that was us? One wish. I would like to believe that in a moment I would ask for the right thing. I was just in Chicago. Had some amazing rib tips. I don't think they have those. I think it's a Chicago thing. I think it's a Chicago thing. I would like to believe that, it, that, that in the moment my heart would project forth what is what, what it desires most. Solomon asks for wisdom. And I know sometimes we can read that in his life and assume that because afterwards he ended up in compromise that he asked for the wrong thing he didn't ask for the wrong thing in fact God rewards him for asking for the right thing he says Lord how can I lead your people or judge your people rightly without what it takes to do it give me wisdom it's possible to start right and then to have the heart corrupted but we need the wisdom of the cross Paul, in fact, refers to himself as a wise master builder. Not of structures, not of organizations, but of people. That's what he's talking about. He says, I've laid the foundation which is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And upon that others would build. But we should be careful with how we build the kinds of materials that we use. Because some things will not make it through the fire. The things that were not anchored in the wisdom of God will not make it through the fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This will be the last passage that we look at. When we talk about wisdom, we're talking about what Paul coins, when he, Paul coins the, the phrase... A man of God should rightly divide the word of God. We need wisdom so that we can judge rightly. In fact, 1 Corinthians, you could stay in 1 Corinthians 2. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul refers to, which by the way, 1 Corinthians is full of the parallel between wisdom and and righteous judgment. Again, remember there's three forms that the word judge is used in the Bible. A way to not judge, the fact that we will all enter into one form of judgment or another, and the fact that we ought to rightly judge or make decisions in a godly way. And in chapter 6, Paul talks about some issues that are taking place in a particular church and he says, is there, is there no one in the midst that is wise enough to determine the way that this should be dealt with? We need wisdom. We need the wisdom of God. Is there nobody who has the wisdom of God according to the cross that can apply it to this situation? You guys have to go find unbelievers to, to coach you through this? Is the cross not the model? We need to bend our lives to the wisdom of the cross. 
And then he says, do you not know that you will judge the world? Do you not know that you will judge angels? Now, what that fully means, I don't, I, I would, I, this is holy ground that I fear to tread on. I know there's different perspectives of what it means. I don't necessarily feel like it, it's like a, you know, us. Anyways, I won't get into it. <laughs> but one of the things I do think that it means is that we will co-rule with him in a way that we will make decisions for those that overcome and, 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 and are called to it. We will make decisions in ways that angels themselves would have to follow suit with do you not know that you would judge the world that you would judge angels we need wise judgment in light of the holiness of God this life is conditioning for the life to come it's important to know that it's important to know that salvation is a gift but reward is received according to how we live our life now you're not going to be you're not going to have a measure of wisdom in the age to come that you did not steward the seed of in this life you will enter into a glorified body in a perfected way and steward in greater measure the wisdom that you that, that you stewarded now and this is what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying, listen, you guys have decisions to be made in your midst, in your family. How you raise your kids. Each one of us, if you're a parent, God has given you a responsibility. I tell my kids all the time, whether you like it or not, I'm going to have to answer to God. Not you. You're not going to be there with me. He's not going to ask you, well, what did you think? No, no, no. I'm going to, me and your mother are going to stand before God's throne one day. We're not going to be held accountable for every choice you made. No, that you're going to do that. I'm going to be held accountable for the kind of home I led and what I allowed into this house. And the way I loved you or didn't love you. The way we walked in godly discipline or we didn't. The way we dealt with situations. I'm going to have to answer for that. We, there are, we need wisdom for judgments, for decisions in our lives from the smallest things to the biggest things. We need to learn how to make godly choices. Amen? Amen? And Paul is saying, listen, you guys are being conditioned right now. In the situations that we may deem to be completely insignificant, you're being conditioned to rule the world. Don't you know that you will judge the world? Don't you know that you will judge angels? You got some people who just got born again in Corinth. Last year he was out partying with his friends. He's got some kind of issues with somebody else. There's all kinds of issues in the Corinthian church. And Paul is saying, don't you realize that this is training? This is a school for the ages to come? And that's why he talks about the cross. He says, and here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. He said, amongst the mature, we impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or even the rulers of this age that are doomed to pass away. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom. It's not secret, by the way, in that God is trying to hide it. It's secret in that nobody in the world seems to be able to find it. Because it's revealed in Christ, not in a five-step book. It says, the wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The wisdom of this world looks like me, 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 me. In one form or another, the devil does not care which religious name you slap on it. Slap any religious name on it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you want. I'm an artist. I'm a businessman. It doesn't matter. This is my orientation. He doesn't care as long as it's you focused, completely self-absorbed with you. That's all he cares about at the end of the day. Pick your religion. Go to church as much as you, as you want to go. Go to the mosque. Whatever. Have your lifestyle choice. As long as you uphold the wisdom of this world. 
which is obsessed with you being on the throne of your life. You determining what's right and wrong for yourself. You living for yourself and, you, and, and, and everything is ultimately centers back on you. As long as you subscribe to the latest subscription of the wisdom of the world, he's okay. And Paul is saying the cross reveals the wisdom of God. The cross reveals the wisdom of God. Because when in, with human logic, worldly wisdom, we would have said, hey, you're at the precipice of being the most famous rabbi that's ever lived. Think about the branding and where we can go and this, that, and the other. And Jesus says, I'm going straight to Jerusalem. And I'm going to give my life, not just for salvation, but to reveal the pattern of the wisdom of God. Because I'm going to redeem nations of people that I will invite back into the original mandate in Eden. That they would know me and love me and rule with me forever. Yeah. Amen? That's what we need. We need the fear of the Lord and the wisdom of God. Do you know spiritual gifts, when Paul talks about spiritual gifts in, 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 in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first spiritual gift he mentions, the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is not just a specific word to your particular situation. It could be that. The word of wisdom is the preaching of the wisdom of cross. The preaching of the wisdom of the cross and the bending of our lives to it. That's what the word of wisdom is. Fear the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. To not fear God is to guarantee the inability to see right. It's to guarantee that inability. It's, it's, I can, we can guarantee according to the truth of God's word, we will not see rightly if we do not fear God, which means we will not make wise decisions. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, and we'll close with this. Matthew 7, Jesus says, after he finishes the Sermon on the Mount, the longest uninterrupted teaching of Jesus in the Gospels. It's a majestic three chapters of Scripture. The constitution of the kingdom of God. And it all ends up with this one statement at the end. Where he says, the wise man is the one who heard the word of God and obeyed it. He built his house on the rock. He doesn't give much time to describe the house. How beautiful the house is. How many rooms the house has. How impressive it is. The kind of windows that he has. But he does emphasize the rock. Upon that upon which the house is fastened. What the house is rooted into. It's rooted in something that's immovable. Doesn't matter. Listen, it doesn't matter how long ago you got born again. It matters where are you standing. What, what is the house of your life rooted on is it is it rooted and it is is it built upon the foundation of of him who is christ on christ and him crucified is it built upon the wisdom of the cross because he says the man who is wise is the man who hears the word of god and obeys and the man who is a fool is the man who hears the word of christ and does not do and does not do May God pour out wisdom upon us in this hour so that we would be men and women that would build his house in accordance to his words. Our life is a house. Your body is a house. Do you know your body's a house? Your body is a temple. It's a house. Guess what? You don't own the house. I don't own the house. Jesus owns the house. My individual, but my family is a house. Us corporately in our spiritual family, our church, we're a house. The church of Jesus in the city of Atlanta, as disjointed as the different churches may be, or joined, I don't know. I mean, there's probably measures of it. When God sees Atlanta, he sees a corporate people amongst those who are the saints of God in, in, in the city. We are a house. Jesus says, I am building my church. He is building a house. Do you know what's... Do you know what makes a house unique to other structures or other things? A house is made to live in. A house has a specific design that other things that we create like books don't have, iPads don't have. You don't live inside your iPad. But you do live inside your house. God is building a house now that he will baptize into his glory, glorified body, the new Jerusalem, a house that he will live in forever. 
And we get to now, in time, in real time, in space, according to the word of Jesus and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we get to grow to become the kind of people that we will be forever. May God release the wisdom of the cross upon us. Amen. I want to invite you guys to stand. We're going to pray before communion. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the, for the wisdom of the cross. We thank you, Lord, for Palm Sunday and for Good Friday, for Resurrection Sunday, for Easter. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are making us into the kind of people that live lives that are cross-shaped. We thank you that the, the word of the cross is power and the word of the cross is wisdom. We thank you that the cross reveals to us your humility and the cross reveals to us your love. We thank you that the cross reveals to us your holiness and it reveals to us your plan. We thank you, Lord, that you rule the world through the truth and the power of the cross. And God, today we ask you, Lord, 2024, greater measure of the wisdom of the cross. Lord, touch our minds with the cross. Lord, deepen our appetite for the word of God, for the Bible, in Jesus' name. Lord, give us a spirit of wisdom, like Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1. A spirit of wisdom. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are a spirit of wisdom. You are a spirit of wisdom and revelation in or unto the knowledge of God. And the way that you do it is you open the eyes of our hearts. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts so that we would see with a wisdom not of this world. Lord, deliver us to whatever degree, even in small ways, that our minds line up with the wisdom of this world. Lord, we don't want to stand before you on that day with ashes to show for our decisions. In Jesus' name. Or for our affections. Lord, we ask you, God, touch our minds and our hearts. Empower us in our decisions so that according to godly wisdom and the word of the Lord, we would judge rightly. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Bless you guys. Thank you. Praise God. Pray that may the Spirit of God continue to fill us with the spirit of wisdom from above. If we can uh, turn our attention to, if the ushers can please bring in the uh, elements. You can come forward and take the elements. Just see if you can please lead us. Mm. You can come forward and get the elements. Chris was talking about how uh, Jews all, all around the world celebrate uh, the festival of Purim these two days, yesterday and today. Uh, just, you know, as you're taking the elements, wants to remind you, I think we are the ones who should be really celebrating uh, Purim uh, because it reminds of how um, Esther stood in the gap for the Jewish community. You know, Mordecai, uh, sorry, uh, Haman, uh, the, a nobleman, wants to kill all the Jews in the world. And Esther stood in gap for the Jewish people. And she gave her life, almost gave her life, to, um, to save the entire Jewish community. You know, it's, it's the same thing that was done for us on the cross. You know, enemy had her, had his um, diabolical wicked scheme to get all mankind, even on the cross, how he thought he has finally won the game. But there it was completely Jesus came in between. He was this ultimate sacrifice. He stood in the gap for us. You know, that's the festival of Purim uh, that we are celebrating as we go uh, in our life.
as i was in prayer yesterday <clears throat> god gave me few download of things that the communion points to and you all know communion this is so sacred and special that god has given this it has got the full potential to reset and recalibrate our lives so i just want to read i'm going to read few points that the spirit of god gave me while i was in uh, prayer yesterday if you want to if you want to close your eyes and meditate uh, on listen uh, with your heart so open to to i'm just this is even the just the i'm just scratching the surface of what communion represents if you can keep your hearts open and listen to few of the points communion brings unity unity between the body among the believers and unity with god himself through jesus communion denotes sanctification hebrews 10:10 says that having been sanctified through the offering of the body of christ as jesus showed complete obedience saying to father here i am to come to do your will communion points to the suffering of jesus that paved a way for our reconciliation to god himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation communion points to the new door that was opened through the body of christ hebrews 10:20 communion points to rock of ages that was cleft for me to pour out living water for you and me and as david reminded to this morning communion points to the essence of the wisdom of god secret and hidden wisdom of god communion points to it's no longer i but christ that lives in me communion points to the unconditional agape love of father communion points to the bridal union with our bridegroom king communion points to the marriage supper of the lamb communion points to the entrance that each one of us received to enter into the most holy place through the blood of Jesus Christ communion points to a life of holiness and purity a covenant life that is consecrated to holiness and purity communion points to a love sick heart that desires only one thing him and him alone in every areas of life communion symbolizes obedience obedience unto death communion points to the victory of jesus and getting the keys of death and the grave communion points to how jesus conquered satan and disarming the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame on the cross communion points to eternal joy available for us in the right hand side of the father hebrews 12:2 jesus for the joy that was set before him endured the cross i also want to remind you this morning communion also today as we heard this morning it also point towards healing i want to read few verses in the scripture when the paralyzed man came to or when he was dropped by his friends in front of jesus jesus said your many sins are forgiven that shows that there is a intricate correlation between the sin and sickness not always but throughout the scriptures scriptures or even the medical community accepts the fact that lot of sickness have a psychological origin in other words there is a connection between the sickness in your body and the sin and he took jesus took your sin upon him and we are healed i just want to read few verses as we look upon the cross from 
the book of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed verse number 8 by oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living stricken for the transgression of my people you and me verse number 12 yet he bore the sins of many and make intercession for the transgressors transgressors first peter chapter 2 verse 24 he himself bore our sin in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed if you can take the elements in your hands also a reminder in second corinthians it talks about if you partake in this communion in an unworthy manner you will bring punishment upon you that means if there is any unconfessed sin that you are still walking to the grace of god is what woos us to a life of holiness and purity that's what we are called to live to walk in and to live so i pray that as we extend our hands to this elements that rep- that is the body as jesus said this this is the body that was broken for you and me scripture says that he was not we were not even able to identify him as a human he was marred he was disfigured so that you and me we will walk in victory so that you and me we will walk in freedom so that you and me we will walk in the fullness of joy thank you jesus for your broken body and the blood that was shed for us on the cross of calvary as we partake in your body and as we drink your blood i pray that may our life continue to be sanctified and set apart to live in sync with the holy spirit and to live to please you and you alone filled with the wisdom of the cross in our day to day life in every decision that we make in every moment that you have given us that will walk in purity and holiness that the body and the blood represent Jesus have your way in us I pray for everyone who are partaking in this body not only here in church but also those who are watching or joining us through online may the presence of God fill every room every hearts every bodies be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit as we partake in your body and in blood we give you glory and honor in Jesus precious name we pray amen you may partake in the body and blood life that you have called us to walk in thank you
you for the privilege that you have given us to partake in your body and in your blood. Even now, Holy Spirit, move in our midst. I pray that every body be healed. Afflictions be removed right now. Sickness be gone in the blood of Jesus. Headaches be gone. Migraines be gone. Nerve issues be gone. Skin issues be gone right now. Sciatic nerve issues be gone. Healing in hearing. Eyes be restored. Eyesight be restored right now. Cancer be gone in the name of Jesus. Hormonal issues be gone right now in the name of Jesus. Complete healing. Physical, emotional, spiritual reconciliation right now. Move Jesus. Healing in the blood of Jesus. Thyroid problems be healed right now in Jesus' name. No more. No more. Lumbar issues, disc issues be gone right now. Healing in Jesus' name. Right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone having issues with L4, L5? Dawn, I see two. Can you, if you, if those around them, can you please lay your hands on those who are lifted hands right now? L4, L5. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your blood be infused right now. No more. Complete healing. Complete healing right now. Never the same. Touched by God for healing to set apart and live for His glory. Right now, be healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right shoulder. Anyone having pain on their right shoulder? Lori here. Anyone else? Right shoulder. I see a few hands. If you can please lay your hands right now. In the name of Jesus, scripture says, I took away the burden from your shoulder. I took it upon the cross. Right now, be healed in Jesus' name. Complete healing. No more. No more pain. Thank you, Jesus. If the worship if the prayer team can please come forward let's continue to worship the Lord in an attitude of prayer and worship he is in our midst he is healing bodies even now those who need prayers you can come forward oh thank you no, no, no. if you can come forward and uh, our prayer team We'll pray for you as we worship the Lord.